Okay, so there might be some other people that will join us. Um, and if they do, uh, you know, certainly they'll jump in wherever we're at. Um, again, if you haven't introduced yourselves, please do so. And um, we are here today for our trauma-informed care workshop, trauma-informed care with a leaning towards what I call recovery and healing or post-traumatic growth. So thank you all for being here. Um, and I appreciate, again, you sharing where you're at this morning. Um, I am Dr. Selena Gupte, uh, you can call me Selena. I am um, an integrated care consultant uh, with the Alameda Health Consortium and CHCN. And I also uh, work and help uh, support a lot of the trainings that happen through AC3 and the Skills Development Unit. Um, I'm also a clinician, so I work at uh, Lifelong Medical Care, um, and I'm an integrative health practitioner. Um, I do homeopathy and naturopathy as well as holistic health coaching. So, you know, I kind of share both of those sides of myself to let you know that I, a lot of what I sh uh, talk about has a grounding in the work that I do with community members as well um, as the larger systemic kind of framework from which we'll be talking about. Um, okay, so thank you for continuing to introduce yourselves because it's always lovely to, to see uh, and hear who you are so I get a sense of, um, of, uh, of the collective. Just a few housekeeping notes, um, you know, to the extent that you can, um, you know, be available today. This is your time, your training. Um, be as comfortable as possible, you know, get that tea, beverage, snacks that you need. Um, if possible, have a pen and paper around. We're gonna do a few exercises. So you might wanna take some notes and then of course, any notes that you might wanna take about um, the content itself. Um, since we are talking about trauma, uh, I do want to say that if there are moments where you, know, you just sort of need a pause, please do so um, and take those moments for yourself. Um, we don't have a formal break, but you know, I always recommend that if you need to stand up, move around, um, whatever you need to do, sitting for two hours is a really, really long time. So do those stretches as you need. Um, and then good morning to those Lawanda, Kiyomi, and Renita. I'm just acknowledging that I see your well, your um, your note in the chat function. So good morning. Um, for those of you that um, you know may not be as familiar with the the technology that we have going on here, the Zoom functionality. Just a quick reminder that you have a scroll bar um, that might be showing up uh, at the top or the bottom of your screen, um, and of course you have the ability to mute or unmute yourselves. I see that most people are um, muted, which is uh, great. I also welcome you to unmute yourselves because this is a very interactive and participatory um, uh, workshop. So please do so. Uh, and to the extent that you will be able to show yourselves, you have the ability to start and stop your video. Um, it's helpful for me, of course, so it doesn't feel like I'm always talking to a blank screen. Um, and particularly when we do breakouts, it would be helpful for you to show your video so that um, your group members can see who you are as well. Um, and then you can, of course, communicate with other participants as you need to. All right, some of our learning, learning objectives for our time together is we're gonna spend some time talking about types of trauma exposure um, and then explore what I call the trauma continuum and specifically toxic stress. And then since this is um, heavily a, a space where I want to bring in different ways that we can work with people, um, I would hope that you'd walk away with at least one intervention for, for healing. Um, from a post-traumatic perspective. Um, here's what I have planned for our time. So there's about th three sections, although we'll start off with a little bit of statistics. Um, uh, and that's uh, sort of the layout of our, our time together. Any uh, questions at this point? Anything that you wanna make sure um, gets covered or any other thoughts, any other logistical needs at this time? At this time? Good morning, I'm Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Colin. Hi, I just joined and I was so excited to be part of this call and this presentation. Although I have to say I have a mandatory company meeting that I have to attend at 11. Okay. So 
I'm going to try to stay on this call. And that one is usually not super participatory if I can, but I, I might have to drop off this call a little. I'm going to try and do both. I don't know, that probably doesn't make very good logical sense, but it's either that or I have to leave at 11. And I'm going to try and stay on, but I might just be an observer from 11 to 12 if that's possible. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate you um, sharing um, that you have some overlapping um, commitments going on, and, and that's totally fine. Um, to the extent that you can be here and participate, we welcome it. Thank you for that. All right, so with your permission, I'll go ahead and launch into our um, into our content. So what I wanted to do is give a, a few statistics to sort of set the stage about how trauma looks um, locally, right? So um, here in Alameda County, what that might look like. So this is something that came from uh, 2019 um, from the Urban Strategies Council. This was a uh, Oak, a, sum, a summit that was done in Oakland, um, where they collected person um, uh, first information, meaning that people self-reported. Um, and they did this through 500 plus type surveys, as well as interviews and focus groups. And this is sort of the lay of the land um, in terms of what we might see, how people self-reported um, their experience of violence and trauma. So, you know, quite a bit of um, different types of experiences here. Some of them might, um, you know, be what we expect. Some might be kind of surprises. Um, there's a couple acronyms here, just in case you need to know the, um, the, uh, the definition of the acronyms are at the bottom of the slide. So, CSEC is commercial sexual exploitation of children, GV is gun violence, and DV is domestic violence. So just to sort of, you know, kind of let you know, this is the latest statistics that we have available um, from the local community in Oakland itself. We can also look at another sort of marker, if you will, of um, violence and trauma through a specific population. And um, this is information that comes from people who are considered homeless. This is, again, self-reported information. So keep in mind, this is 2019 data as well. So it's not going to reflect what we are currently at or where we're currently at, especially with all the changes that have happened this year in 2020. But um, as of last year, we had approximately 8,000 individuals that were considered people who were homeless. And then you can see the uh, breakdown in terms of the subpopulations um, and also, you know, kind of the, um, the framework of sheltered versus unsheltered within these population groups. If we take that a step further and look at health conditions, um, you might see the spread here, right, of things that people are experiencing. Now, again, this is among the 8,000 plus individuals who are part of that um, uh, homeless count, if you will, again, from 2019. And if you're looking at this information, just curious to know what, what jumps out at you here? What are some themes? What are some um, things that might be surprising or maybe not so surprising? And you can put them in the chat, your answers into the chat function and or unmute yourself. So looking at this information, what looks interesting, surprising, maybe um, even expected? We were kind of thinking that um, me and Louisa we're in the same room. <laughs> we were kind of thinking that uh, this the stats would be a little bit higher, mm -hmm. um, especially for the psychiatric emotional conditions. Uh, we were thinking that it might might be higher, or it you know could have been higher. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. Thank you, Lynette and Louisa. Yeah, um, and again, I I would agree with you, especially given all the circumstances of this year. Um, and um, this is also, um, you know, kind of diagnosis information. So when there's um, something that's un, 
um, undiagnosed and or not um, you know, officially named, let's say, or not recognized, it doesn't show up in our data, right? It doesn't show up in our statistics. So um, yeah, I think that uh, these numbers could be higher, particularly around the, the first one, psychiatric emotional. Um, and then Lola says, surprise with the last three. Yeah, so um, the, the stats there. Anything else? Any, anyone see any overlaps? or the type of information that we're seeing here? What type of conditions are we seeing? Well, when this is Nancy, when you say overlap, um, I, I think what you're meaning is somebody who has more than like one or two of these, right? Like maybe three of these conditions all at once. And, um, I certainly have witnessed a lot of PTSD from the residents that I work with who are living outside or in their car uh, for years, you know, and then it becomes, I don't know if that is what's put on a condition or whether that was there initially a mental, um, a mental psychiatric condition, an emotional condition, or certainly stemmed from the trauma of being that vulnerable. Um, the alcohol and drug use, I don't know so much about the residents of my property, but I certainly know that the PTSD and the psychiatric, and then of course the physical disabilities, so many of them have you know, on wheelchairs, and yeah, it's yeah. kind of like a big storm of, of all of them and how they're trying to cope with it. And and then, yeah, and, yeah. and being able to reach them, it's really hard because like I was talking to a resident yesterday and she doesn't stop talking. Like I can't even get a word in. Uh -huh. It's like a, I call it like a figure eight. <laughs> I just keep going. <laughs> and so you have to be like really strong to stop them or her, and uh, and I'm not sure if that's part of a, a medical condition, but it's a mental condition, but it's, yeah. it's just hard to reach them sometimes. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Nancy, for, for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, the, the overlapping, I, I like the way that you said that it's like a figure eight, right? This is like continuous like loop of information and, um, you know, the, probably the, ability, the, the fact that people don't often get the opportunity to really share what's going on with them. And so, you know, the, they're, they're um, in, that, in that conversation um, over and over again, looping the information. And there's also, you know, the fact that a lot of these are co-occurring um, and so whether or not, I don't, I'm not clear on whether or not these statistics actually um, are showing the real co-occurrence of the physical health conditions as well as the um, mental health and behavioral health conditions, right? So um, I, I also believe that these numbers could probably be higher if we were to capture um, that information. Are they separated by ethnic backgrounds? Good question. I don't think so. I think these are collapsed data by whomever reported uh, this information. Um, I do believe if we go back to the point in time count survey, um, which is available online, um, which is where this information comes from, they do have a racial ethnic breakdown um, in their data. But as far as the data that you see here, it's all encapsulated. Um, and I think you raise a good point, Lola, which is potentially we might see something different here. Like if we were to look at the breakdown in terms of um, race, race ethnic, ethnicity and culture, for sure. So let's take this out to the US, right? So we were kind of like thinking about like local um, Oakland then Alameda County, and this is US based information. Um, and take a look at the numbers here. I was just wondering kind of any comments, thoughts about what you see here. This is adults and children based information. Anything jumping out or surprising about this data? I'll say the first time I looked at this, I was taken aback by um, the 98% of female offenders have experienced trauma, and then you know 90% of uh, adolescent psychiatric inpatients. Just, just, I mean, that's those are high numbers. It's for virtually everyone. 
And Christy adds, yeah, trauma seems to be the common thread. Absolutely. Yeah. If we were to sort of think back to and really get the stories of what these individuals may have experienced in their lives, we will potentially find trauma as a common thread. So basically to say, you know, trauma is prevalent, tra trauma experience is high, and it's really, really important to kind of bring this to the surface through different types of conversations, which I'm so glad that all of you are here to um, be a part of this because this is where it starts. So let's talk about what is trauma. So I would love to hear from you, and if you wouldn't mind putting these in the chat feature, what are some things you think about when you hear the word trauma? What does trauma mean? What does it represent? Um, what are some common um, words, nomenclature, phrases that represent trauma? Give you a few moments to write some thoughts down in the chat feature there. Scars, yeah, thank you. Scars of different kinds. Mm -hmm. Claudia, uh, high on process stress, thank you. LaShawn, abuse, yes, thank you. So the different ways it can manifest, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Lola, for naming it. Yes, racial injustice is a daily trauma and results in kind of the toxic stress that we are going to talk about and see um, over within our current generation as well as intergenerationally. Okay. So what I would like to offer to you is a one definition of trauma. So this comes from uh, the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration, also known as SAMHSA. Um, and this is kind of like it sets a framework, if you will, right? A framework by which to understand really the complex nature of trauma, right? So we're looking at things that, you know, people, um, experience, um, they come as a result of an event and then has these long-term uh, consequences or effects. And what it affects is people on multiple levels. So in their functioning, mental, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual levels of the self. So trauma affects people from a holistic perspective. And therefore, when we think about how to support people, we also have to think about coming from that holistic perspective, not only from an individual basis, but also from an organizational and systemic way of supporting people around trauma. So, you know, what we know about people who have experienced trauma is that, you know, things that have happened in the past can influence current behaviors. And for each person, we're going to talk about their life experiences in their own personal, unique way. For example, some people might not even use the word trauma, right? That's a word that we use because that's our vocabulary, our nomenclature right now. But for some people, you know, it might be just a bad experience or a rough night or a difficult childhood, right? So we have to pay attention to the words and also maybe ask more questions, which we're gonna talk about how we do that um, in uh, the second part of our, our workshop today, um, but ask about the experiences a little bit more to kind of um, you know, get a sense of what the real truth is for each person. So going back to that original definition that I, that I shared with you, you saw that there were three E's that were kind of highlighted there. So, the three E's of trauma are events. These are typically things that cause trauma. And usually they're outside of the individual. There's the experience that of course is gonna be individual and differ for every individual. You know, and two people can be in a car accident and one person, um, you know, gets up, walks away, totally fine. Other person um, has effects in the moment, maybe a week later, a month later, a year later. 
And the effects are going to be disguised often as symptoms and behaviors, right? So to pay attention to the different types of ways that um, the effects of trauma can show up. So we're going to kind of dive into each of, each of these just a little bit more. And so let's start with events. So I would love to hear from you, how would we classify things that, um, that people um, experience? So for example, in the category, like we can describe events as things that might be considered abuse, things that might be considered loss, and things that might be considered chronic stressors. So let's start with the column of abuse. What might fall under abuse? If we were to name events that might fall under the category of abuse, what, what comes up for you? Abusive childhood. Mm -hmm. Childhood abuse. Conflict, sure. severe conflict during childhood of crazy stories. Um, and also I would say theft, like people claim that a family member or someone else stole their financial means. Uh-huh losing their house and other things. Yeah, thank you. And then we have some additional physical and a sexual abuse, yep. Anything else in terms of the abuse category that you can think of? Thank you, Lynette, emotional abuse, yep. So the wide variety of different types of abuse can look Emotional, sexual, physical, you, you know, domestic violence falls on, might fall under here. Witnessing violence can be a form of abuse as well. And even things like, you know, bullying. How about loss? What falls in the category of loss? Divorce, uh-huh. Or separation, let's say from family members to losing housing, yep. Death, of course, yeah. Also abandonment, neglect. Mm -hmm. We might consider loss from things like a natural disaster, which might be you know, losing housing or losing uh, personal effects um, from accidents or even loss from uh, terrorism or war and being displaced. How about chronic stressors? What might we see here? So think kind of like, you know, broadly systemically, why it might show up here. You see financial, yes. Mm -hmm. Poverty, homelessness, yep. What else? Environmental stressors, racism, yep. So, you know, chronic stressors over time will look like discrimination, prejudices, um, the isms, um, all the isms that exist, um, even things like medical procedures, like our healthcare um, uh, institutions are almost set up to be traumatizing, right? And while there might be some things that are necessary, let's say like surgery, for example, the whole experience of that can be pretty traumatizing. Um, we're gonna talk about community and historical trauma in just a moment. Um, and also to mention that, you know, having certain health conditions can be considered traumatic. Um, you know, people who live with HIV, for example, or, you know, even people who experience like chronic disease, like um, diabetes, for example, the, the stress uh, of that can be considered trauma, the stress of managing that. All right. So moving on to the experience of trauma. So this is our second E. So the experience of trauma may be affected by all of the things that you see here, right? Um, how, when, where, how often something occurs. Um, and we can almost, we can classify the different types of trauma, like, you know, acute trauma, for example, is um, exposure to a single event. Um, complex trauma is when there is multiple or chronic uh, prolonged events. Um, and then we have, you know, complex trauma, which is basically all of that combined with interpersonal relationships. Um, there's developmental trauma, which we'll talk about in a few moments around how people fare through uh, their growing years. So the experience of trauma, again, is going to look really different for everyone based on all of these different factors. 
What are some other things that might play a role in the experience of trauma? Anything else you wanna add here or wanna think about or hear from your clients? Mm -hmm. Cultural background for sure. And how even, you know, things get talked about or not talked about. Gender, absolutely. Yeah, Christy, thank you. If you have a support system or if you don't have a support system, which uh, I see that was added. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know your first name. I see L. Shirley, so um, lack of support, yep. So in addition to, oh, sorry. Hi, it's Lauren. Lauren. Lauren Shirley, thank hi. You, I'll, I'll, remember, I'll try to remember that, Lauren, thank you. Um, yeah, so in addition, in addition to all the things that you've mentioned, right, the earlier the trauma occurs can play a role as well. And also remembering that the earlier the trauma might happen in a person's life, the, the details of it might be there or not be there, right? If anyone has been blamed or shamed, um, or if there's a feeling of guilt, Oftentimes the most common experience is to feel guilty or feel to feel ashamed about what happened. And therefore it um, causes people to not share their stories as at all. You know, so one of the best things that we can do is, you know, let people know that what happened was not their fault at all. Um, if people have been silenced and then, um, you know, if the perpetrator was someone that someone knew. Um, yeah, so in addition to the ones that you all have mentioned and they're really, really good ones, socioeconomic status plays a role, immigration, of course the mental health status before trauma occurs for sure. So moving on to the third E, if we consider effect of trauma, an effect can be something that we, you know, might be, might be considered normal, right? Might be considered something that's an understandable response to the situation, to an experience someone has had. Um, and it might, you know, whether or not we agree with it or not, it might be considered justifiable. But it might be coping mechanisms that someone has engaged in because of what they've experienced. And it's the only way that they know how to really function, if you will. What are some effects of trauma that we might consider normal or understandable? based on what people might have experienced. Think about that holistic nature of how trauma can affect people. Mm -hmm. People hypervigilance, like, you know, engaging in substances. Mm -hmm. Hypersensitivity, absolutely, right? So what you're describing is sort of that, you know, holistic nature, denial, thank you. All, the holistic nature of how trauma shows up, right? Physically can be things like more pain, sleeping disturbances, headaches, emotionally, of course, all over the board with where that might be, whether people show emotion or don't, there might be numbness. Behaviorally, we might see uh, engaging in self-harm as a way to cope, in addition to what you've all shared already. Cognitively, how people process information, uh, have memory, et cetera. And then from a spiritual perspective, like holding that self-blame, that guilt, maybe even questioning one's own purpose, if you will. So a lot of the different ways that um, trauma can affect people. All right, so let's take a moment and talk about historical and intergenerational trauma. So again, from a, a sort of a conceptual framework of what this is, is it's a really a, um, a psychological wounding, if you will, that comes about from um, a long-term cumulative experience um, from people who've either experienced the actual situation or 
that gets transferred from one generation to another generation. And then that generation um, is surrounded by the effects of that original traumatic experience, right? And so over time, generations cope, they adapt, um, and it, all of that gets transmitted again across communities and generations as well. What is usually true about historical trauma is that there is an emotional component to it, right? There's unresolved grief, anger, maybe even there's suppression of, of feelings, and it leads to health conditions, like physical and behavioral health conditions that we might see. So for example, if we see someone with chronic pain and you know maybe there's no like diagnostic information to really point to why that experience of chronic pain is so bad for that person. The fact is that maybe there was trauma in the background and or generational trauma that has transmitted to this person and therefore that's part of the pain experience. Unfortunately, what we know in the US is that is this is highly correlated with racial and ethnic populations. Um, what are some examples of intergenerational trauma and historical trauma that we know about? I put one up here in terms of this picture, right? The Japanese internment camps. What are some other things that have happened historically that can be transmitted from generation? Uh-huh, slavery. Holocaust. Yep. Yeah, I think about um, the Native American populations and all the displacement. Uh, yeah, Jim Crow laws, they, yeah. Lisa added Native Americans, yes. So we can point to a lot of different types of things that have happened historically um, that play a role in how the current generation experiences life and functions. Um, I am very curious to see how this year in particular will show up in terms of future generations, um, right? We're looking at a, a time period where a lot of toxic stress anxiety, depression, et cetera, is high. And so what that might look like for people, um, all types of people um, in the future. All right, so now we're gonna get an opportunity for you all to kind of connect and talk to each other. This will be our first opportunity to do so. So what we're gonna do is, um, um, Yadiel, who is my, my wizard behind the scenes here, um, uh, supporting um, some of the technology is going to put you in two groups. So you'll be in groups of at least two people. You might have three people in some of your groups. Um, and to answer these two questions, how does trauma show up in your work? And what are some of the words that people might use to describe what has happened to them? Right? So while they might not use the word trauma, what are some other words that you may have heard? All right, so I would love to hear from um, one or two folks about how that um, conversation went, anything that um, you'd like to share with the larger group about what you talked about, um, just sort of high level points. I'll check in with my group, what um, the young lady was sharing about how it shows up at her job you know, with the clients that they serve. And I can agree with her how it shows up also at my job with the ladies that we serve in treatment here and their mental health. And then what came up for me too also is that trauma can show up in my own life as well with, you know, me dealing with my PTSD on a regular basis and staying calm and you know, uh, consistent with the clients and not allowing that to get in the way with the way that I help and serve the clients here where I work also. Yes, thank you, LaShawn. So not only like um, the, the concept of how trauma shows up for people, people that you work with, but also for yourself and being aware of that and what you need to do, the skills and practices you need to do to help support yourself. 
Mm -hmm. Which also, it comes first, right? Taking care of yourself first so that you're able to then be there and support others. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, LaShawn. Anyone else? Yeah, I, me and Louise are in the same group, which is kind of funny because we're also in the same room. (laughs) Funny. (laughs) (laughs) So she left the room just to figure out that we're in the same group. That's uh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But we were talking about uh, like how a lot of the times the clients don't have words for their experiences. Um, A lot of times they're in denial about it or they just, it's just normal or like a, um, like we were discussing like intergenerational trauma, like it's just something that the family has experienced and doesn't seem out of the ordinary for them. Um, and also, cause we serve a lot of um, minorities and, um, or first generation folks and um, seeking out help or like, you know, actually putting a name to the, the ex- their experiences isn't something that happens um, very often. Like we have, a client that um, regularly experienced uh, abuse from their partner, but couldn't see that that was an issue or a problem. Um, And we're thinking that maybe it's just because of how she was raised or like, you know, the environment that she grew up in um, Mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, normalized these kinds of experiences. So it kind of takes us as clinicians to be able to name the issue of the trauma that has happened and how they might be reacting to it. Right, thank you, Lynette and Louisa. Um, And uh, yes, that was very important piece of that, which is that um, people often don't have the I what they ha, what they experience might seem just like oh that's part of life right that's how that's that's how it goes but as a person interacting with them and the ability to kind of like reflect to them no this this is actually like what we might call trauma um, is really important for the, the person to hear and certainly opens up um, a different level of conversation. And um, Yadiel put a message to you <laughs> in there that she purposely put you guys together because uh, you were in the same room. So I'm glad that worked out. Okay, so um, thanks for engaging in this in this conversation here. Um, and I'm gonna move us on because we have quite a bit of information to go through. So I wanna make sure that we have um, some time to do that. So we're gonna take a moment to talk about the different types of t- trauma exposure. And so this is um, kind of a, um, a extension of what we've just been talking about is the, the types of um, words, if you will, and the types of descriptions that are part of the trauma experience. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put up some questions for you through our poll feature and you will see these pop up on your screen. So go ahead and answer um, the, what you think the answer is. So what we're doing here is we're looking at definitions. So this first question that you see up here, what is, this is the definition, what is emotional residue of exposure from hearing trauma stories and becoming witness to the pain, fear, terror, terror that trauma survivors have endured? What is that? Let me give just a few more moments for some um, other uh, answers to come in. Okay. So this is where we landed that um, we're thinking that this is either secondary traumatic stress or vicarious trauma. This in fact is called vicarious trauma. So the formal word, for what you see here is known as vicarious trauma. So that's when there is, um, you know, this, what they call residue of exposure, basically, you know, the, the taking on the trauma stories that other people have shared 
um, and that being part of your own experience. That's known as vicarious trauma. Secondary traumatic stress is actually very similar. So those of you that answered that, you're not too far off um, because that is the indirect exposure to trauma um, and or the firsthand accounts that people share. So this secondary traumatic stress is more like when you hear news or you're watching, let's say, violent movies, right? That's the subtle difference there. So they're both very similar, but this definition in itself is known as vicarious trauma. All right, what is this? So sec uh, second question is the emotional and physical exhaustion that comes from, excuse me, that leads to a diminished ability to empathize or feel compassion for others. What is this known as? All right, a few more moments for folks to answer. Okay, so I'm gonna show where we ended up. So yeah, so this is known as compassion fatigue. So when we feel emotional and physical exhaustion, and it takes away our ability to hold empathy or to hold compassion. That's known as compassion fatigue. Um, I actually made up the last term here, which is called traumatic emotional drain. So I appreciate that um, someone put that up there because I feel like that's part of compassion fatigue as well. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so that's the answer for that one. Let's go to the next one, which is, what is a way of victim blaming? attitudes, behaviors, and practices, which can result in additional trauma for the client. So an example of that might be saying to them, well, you asked for that to happen to you. What is that known as? Okay, just a couple more minutes for folks to put in some answers. So when we get to the point where we're so fatigued, let's say, that we sort of turn it around and say, hey, you know what, you caused it. You asked for that to happen. What is that? Okay, so Looks like for the most part, people answer secondary victimization, which is that is what is this is. When we switch to from that place of compassion and empathy, and then we go to victim blaming. Where does that come from? That comes from feeling fatigued, uh, feeling burnt out, feeling overwhelmed. Right, so that's kind of the, the uh, result of compassion fatigue is that we move into this, potentially can move into this place of secondary victimization. Okay. And then how about this one? Emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion that comes from excessive or prolonged stress. It happens when you feel overwhelmed, emotionally drained, or unable to meet constant demands. What is this one? Okay. All right, looks like you, you most of you, you got it. Yeah, this is known as burnout. So you can see sort of the trajectory of like how all of the information that we take in from other people as caretakers, as helping professionals, that is what happens is that it can take a toll on us, right? Um, whoops. I don't think I shared the results with you. That was known as burnout. So just so that you can see it here. Okay. So 
we just went through these definitions here. And the, the purpose of this really was to take what we've just talked about, which is how tra trauma shows up for other people and also name it for what happens for us potentially, right? Because we're part of the experience also. We're part of the fact that what happens when others share their story is that it also can affect us. And um, I appreciate how, um, I believe it was LaShawn who mentioned that, you know, if we've had our own trauma and our own backgrounds, that can play a role too. Any questions, thoughts about that or any of this, uh, what we've talked about so far before I move us on? Okay. So while it's not so important to know all of these, base, you know, the ins and outs of all these definitions, what I wanted to say that's most important about this is that for helping professionals and people that work in, um, you know, helping industries, um, burnout is something that can happen much, much quicker. And so it's it's really important to be aware of that. You know, in most professions, um, you know, burnout can happen in any profession, quite frankly. If you're overwhelmed or, you know, exhausted from the work, you can um, experience burnout. For the most part, you can leave your job and start a new job and, you know, potentially be okay. However, for people who are in the helping industry, caretaking industry, helping professionals, care managers, et cetera, um, the, the burnout goes with us and it also comes quicker. So just being aware of that for yourselves. Okay, so now I wanna move us on to how trauma affects the brain and brain development. So, you know, all experiences in life can change the brain, but not all have the same or equal impact on the brain. And particularly when we're talking about how trauma affects the brain, the brain, it has um, the ability to shape um, experiences, human experiences. So, um, right, so trauma at any age can affect the brain. Um, and here you see the different parts of, uh, of the brain. So, you know, very from a very simplistic sort of framework, we have uh, a top part of the brain and we have a bottom part of the brain. Uh, if we start with the bottom part of the brain, um, it controls what we might call the most simple functions, though they're not that simple. They're really critical mm -hmm. for survival, things like your heart rate, your breathing, blood pressure, et cetera. And then the top parts of the brain control more of the complex sort of functions. These are the functions that, you know, require a little bit more of the, the you know, the neural networks to, to work together. So thinking, problem solving, emotion regulation, etc. So what happens during childhood is that um, things happen in a sequential order. So, for example, we will learn how to, you know, crawl before we learn how to walk. Um, or we learn to babble before we learn to actually like form uh, words and then form sentences, right? So there's a certain order that happens. However, people who have experienced trauma, let's say early in life or through the development period, that ability to go in that sequential order and for it to happen at a rapid fashion gets impacted. And so that's how we see trauma show up specifically around brain development and cognition for um, for many people is that the ability to kind of go through that experience in a normal fashion has been impacted. And so therefore it affects people over time. And um, it also plays a role in what's called toxic stress. Now toxic stress can be related to not only brain development itself, but in terms of what people experience on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So there are different types of stresses, right? There's positive stresses and there's negative stresses. Um, positive stresses are things that like, you know, like what's an example of a positive stress? Anyone have any ideas about what that might be? Exercise? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Or things like, you know, planning a wedding, right? For, for most people, that's a stressful experience. 
um, presenting to a group. Yeah, absolutely. So these are known as types of stresses that, you know, do bring about a sense of anxiety, if you will. Um, and they're mild elevations, but typically the person should be able to go back to normal. Tolerable stresses are a level up from that where it's more of a serious long-term um, impact, but with supportive relationships or with healing, you know, one can potentially overcome those. So that might look like, you know, someone who's um, lost a loved one, for example, on a typical framework, one over time, though the memory is still there, the um, person can um, move on from uh, a loss, let's say. Toxic stress is prolonged activation. And what happens in toxic stress is that the body is not able to go back to norm. And then everyday little stressors are overwhelming for the person so that they respond in a more stressed out manner. And this is more linked to the physical and mental health conditions that we might see. So I would argue that we are currently all experiencing some level of toxic stress. Um, and that this is, you know, what I've seen in my work with clients is the more and more of that um, expression of um, emotional distress, um, anxiety, depression, triggers around trauma experiences, dreams, nightmares, loss of sleep, et cetera. All of that is part of that because the body is not able to actually calm and get back to norm. Any thoughts or questions about that? We're gonna get back to this um, when we talk about ways to work with people, but I wanted to bring it up now so that we kind of have the framework. Okay, hoping that this is making sense so far. Okay, so let's talk about um, the adverse childhood experiences or what's known as the ACE study. And I'm curious to know what you might already know about um, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, the ACE study itself. If anyone is willing to um, unmute themselves and share and or put it in the chat feature. What are adverse childhood experiences? I'm taking silence to mean that potentially this is new information. Okay, <laughs> so it sounds like um, this might be some new information for some folks. Okay. Yeah, Lynette, so it's related to trauma. Absolutely, yeah. So basically what the adverse childhood experiences and the ACEs study specifically was a study that was done um, in the 80s or so. And it started off um, in the field of overweight and obesity. And there was a, a practitioner who was kind of looking at, you know, why the women, um, the certain women that he was working with were experiencing overwhelming overweight and obesity. And as he, as he did um, kind of a, um, a narrative with these folks, if you will, he learned that these are people that had experienced some form of trauma in their early childhood. And then that was expanded out to see how other things in people's lives can play a role in their health, um, not only their physical health, but their mental health, um, different behaviors that people engage in, um, you know, even things like, you know, um, what we might call risky health behaviors, if you will. So adverse childhood experiences or trauma that occurs early in life has a relationship to health outcomes and long-term health and social outcomes. That's essentially what the ACEs uh, set up for us. From that, we actually have a, um, a tool, if you will, it's, it's an ACE um, questionnaire or ACE assessment tool. 
And these are some of the areas by which they collect information on how people fare in terms of their health and social outcomes. So notice that, you know, in the left hand top corner here, we're looking at like, you know, behaviors that one might engage in because of um, the experience of trauma and or other things that affect health and um, social lives. This is just a short list. It doesn't include everything, but you can see some of the things that we know as a result of ACEs people experience. What we also know is that there is a correlation with the number of ACEs or the ACE score and the risk, right? So the more ACEs one has, the more likely they are to experience one or more of these different things. What I, what I learned is true is that um, if a person has one ACE, there's actually 87 to 90% chance that they have more than one ACE. And in the communities that we work in, we're looking at ACE scores that are like in the teens, right? Compared to um, the average population, which might be on the lower end of the scale at, you know, zero to four ACEs. So in our communities, ACEs are much higher. And this is kind of a information that took me aback, which was to say that people who have six or more ACEs have a possibility of life, uh, death, loss of life, nearly 20 years earlier than those without ACEs. So there's a 20 year difference in terms of quality of life that may happen if one has multiple ACEs, or if we can trace it back to, you know, multiple types of trauma that one has experienced. And these are some of the things that, you know, we know happen for people who have experienced trauma. So I'm going to take a pause here, ask if you have any reflections and anything coming out when you look at this slide. Anything look surprising, look like what you expect to see, anything that feels like it's off in terms of the data? Are there other things that you've noticed that people experience that are not named? Yes, this is Lola. Hi, Lola. Hi. Um, I would like to add uh, that I don't see is that um, not every child or person who has experienced trauma ends up on the negative side. Um, sometimes that trauma as a child is used to um, propel you and excel you. Um, in my case, um, having um, trauma, you know, I had a parent who was incarcerated and obviously growing up and being raised by my grandparents, that was um, somewhat traumatic. However, I used that experience to excel me into this kind of A-type personality where, you know, I, I flipped, totally broke the cycle and flipped everything around to where I was a, a better person and did and, and, and exceeded in things because that I, because I wanted to be better than what I, that trauma that I knew. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Lola, for, for bringing that up. That's a really important point and also for sharing your, your personal example there. Um, yes, absolutely. With, with everything that, um, that I'm sharing here today and for everything that we talk about, of course, there's going to be um, exceptions to that. And absolutely, we have a lot of examples of people who um, have flipped, as you said, and used um, the experience to propel them into a different place and a different life experience, for sure. Um, so I appreciate you bringing that up. 
And we're, you know, in just a few moments that, that also speaks to the resilience, right? The resilient nature of people and humans in general. Um, and that's, your story actually sounds to me like a story of resilience. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Determination more, determination as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, so yeah, so some examples of what could happen, right? And then of course, Lola mentioned that there might be circumstances where people are not, do not end up in um, in any of this, um, uh, these sorts of um, circumstances um, or even behaviors, if you will. Um, but just to note what is what could be possible, right? And this this comes from studies and data and research. So just to sort of put that framework on there. But what we know also, and Lola, again, I appreciate that you shared this, your story, is that our brains can change, right? And we have this thing called neuroplasticity, which means that we can also adapt, um, we can um, overcome, we can be determined, we can be resilient, right? And all of that is based on the environment around us, um, the supportive aspects, our experiences, even ways that we approach life and some mind-body kind of perspectives, which we'll talk about as well. All right, so let's keep going and talk about the trauma continuum. So this is um, kind of a way to look at how trauma can show up for, for different people. And there's sort of this spectrum that's called the trauma continuum. So there's trauma that can experience, can, excuse me, can appear as shock. There's trauma that appears as actual trauma, right? And then there's trauma that appears as stress. So those are the three columns that you see here. And not that you need to, you know, know any, all of the details, but there's, you know, part of the brain that gets affected. There's a part of the nervous system. There's an actual response, um, which is the fight, flight, or freeze, which we'll get into in just a second. And then there's an orientation to time, right? So just to pull this out is to say that when people are in a shock state, they're actually in a dissociated state, meaning that they're not in the present moment. They're more in the past. They're living in the past or they're living in the experience. Trauma has this past present duality, right? So the, the experience is the past or, they're, or the you know, living in the experience they have, though they are currently present. That's where a lot of people are at, right? They're, they have had trauma in their background, but they're also still have the memory of it, still have the effects of it. And then stress is um, more of the, it's being in the present moment. And so the ways that we can work with people who are feeling constant or tra uh, toxically stressed uh, will be based on that. So the state of the person determines the type of intervention. And we'll, we'll get to that in just a few moments to talk about different ways we work with people. But I wanted to just sort of mention the fight, flight, or freeze, right? Which is a way that we know people often will react to um, any of the things that we saw just a second ago, whether it's shock, trauma, or stress. People generally go into this fight, flight, or freeze mode. So what this is, is, you know, the brain sig signals to the body a threat and then ordinarily kind of like toxic stress when it's um, at a low level, it goes back to baseline. But if it's at an ongoing threat or the body is overwhelmed, the person stays in an on position of that fight, flight or freeze. So let's talk about this uh, a little bit more. And I'm wondering from you, what might show up? Uh, what might you see from people? So in terms of the, um, the fight, what are some symptoms or behaviors that people show when they're in fight mode? You can put that into chat or say out loud. What does fight look like for people? Physically, emotionally, Maybe things that people are doing with their bodies. Mm -hmm. Elevated heart rate. Defense. Yeah. 
Yeah, sweating. Yeah, clenched fixed, you guys got this. So in, in fight mode, typically people are like, you know, in that tight space. They're tight, fixed body hands, uh, rapid breathing, maybe grinding the fists. Um, there's just desire to kind of like lash out, if you will. Obviously feelings of anger, rage, tense, feeling defensive. One might cry. Um, there might be some shaking, LaShawn ad added that, or a feeling of knots in the stomach. What, else, what about flight? When you see flight in a person, what is showing up? What are some things, a, sh a shrugged stance, stance, <laughs> uh -huh. not even to keep eye contact, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Lola, thank you, yeah. Running away, lack of attention, yeah. So this sort of restlessness, um, it, it can also be numbness, right? It can be both sides of that. Um, anxiety, um, you might see big eyes, you feel, you get this sense of pe people like might be feeling trapped, but they want to get away, right? They wanna run. We might see like behaviors like excessive exercise, right? Because that is the feeling of running and wanting to get away. How about in freeze mode? What might show up there? Yeah, not being responsive in autopilot, disengaged, yeah. So one might feel stuck. Um, there might be a feeling, a literal feeling of being frozen or cold, stiffness, heaviness, holding the breath, um, a sense of dread, right? There's just, there's sort of an orientation to threat. So just to bring this out to say that we might be able to kind of sense where a person is at based on that fight, flight, or freeze. Has anyone heard of, there's another F that's called fawn. Anyone heard of fawn or know what that is? So the most common responses are this fight, flight, or freeze, but there's also this notion of fawning. Okay, so the fawning is essentially um, being in a, uh, a people pleasing kind of mode, right? So appeasing, maybe appeasing the perpetrator or befriending the person. Um, flattering the other person, right? It's, it's sort of this um, putting your own self aside and um, engaging in the, um, the needs of the other person. That's sort of fawning, if you will. So just a, you know, a bit of information of, of another type of response that can often show up. Any questions about this so far? Okay. So I wanna take us out for just a couple of moments to talk about how we can think of, so, so far we've been talking about how trauma shows up within you know, individuals, communities, generations, um, even for ourselves, if you will. But the fact is, is that we live and work and function in communities, in organizations, in systems. And so, Coming from, so, you know, trauma, trauma informed care is not only what happens with people, from people to people, person to person, but it's also what has to happen to support those who work in the field and work with individuals and communities um, who've experienced trauma. So, what is trauma informed care? From a very sort of, you know, um, this is not to say a simplistic perspective, but trauma-informed care is a shift or a change in organizational culture, which comes from the place of understanding that trauma has a pervasive nature 
and that um, we need to collectively create environments that support more healing and recovery. So going from sort of the, you know, the triggering nature of systems and organizations to one that is more healing and recovery based. And it supports people from an individual level, right? So it's, you know, client relationships, even like in terms of how do we ask the right types of questions and support people to an organizational level. How do we even create environments, let's say waiting rooms that support people um, in the best way. And then systematically is from more of a policy perspective um, and how organizations are um, work and function on a day-to-day -day level. So really trauma-informed care is a strengths-based model that focuses on, again, healing and recovery. These are the principles of trauma-informed care. Uh, you can see there's six of them. And while they're all individual, they also all overlap, right? And so that's the important part of this is to think about how each of these plays a role with each other. So safety uh, trustworthiness, uh, transparency, having peer support available, collaboration, empowerment voice, uh, choice, and then cultural, historical, and gender issues, and how all of those play a role with each other, overlap with each other. That's kind of from an organizational perspective, is all of these elements need to be in place and they also need to be supportive of each other. So what does this mean, right? If to like kind of break this down to like, what does this mean for the work that we do? Well, it's really shifting the culture from this more victim blaming place of what's wrong with you to what happened to you. You know, tell me about your life. Tell me about your experiences. Tell me your story, which is more kind, open-ended and really supports people in sharing more about themselves. And it moves from this, um, that space of again, victim blaming to one of protection and hope and that strengths model. So asking people, you know, what are they good at? Where are their strengths? And maybe highlighting that. So it goes from that old kind of deficit-based to the more strengths-based place. Looking at this, what kind of draws your attention in terms of how to support people from a strengths-based perspective? You know, I can think of examples of people that I've worked with where the, the way that, um, you know, they're presenting themselves is that they might, you know, often people will label them as that they're just attention seekers, right? They just want attention. They, they're very needy. Well, to move that to a strengths-based kind of model is to say, you know, they're just, they're just trying to connect. They're just trying to be in connection because that's something that might have been missing something that they have never had maybe early in life particularly. Yeah. Provides hope similar to the growth mindset, yeah. And to take that a step further is that we might look at going from what here is described as trauma organized, although I wouldn't necessarily call these things as being organized, um, to being trauma informed, to ultimately being what is a healing organization. So going from trauma inducing to trauma reducing, right? So um, trauma organized is more of that reactive standpoint, um, more of that authoritarian, author, I can't even say the word, authoritarian leadership versus 
trauma-informed is kind of where we are right now, right? We're doing, talking about the language, talking about the nature, getting that foundational understanding, bringing in the, the racial disparities lens, um, gender perspective lens to healing, which is more reflective, collaborative, growth-oriented, relational. So I'm gonna put up a quick poll because I'm just curious to, to hear from, from you guys. Oh, sorry, I hope that um, that wasn't up the whole time, but how would you describe your organization? So where you are, where do you think you, your organization maybe lands on this, um, on this spectrum, if you will? Do you feel like you, and you know, this is all anonymous, but do you feel like you, are part of a more of a reactive place, um, avoiding or numbing to more trauma informed, which it comes from, you know, more about like trying to understand trauma a bit more to healing, which is more growth, relational, collaborative. Great. Wonderful. Okay, so I'm just going to show you what we've heard so far from some folks. So we're on the spectrum of here, mostly trauma informed healing. Um, and I would love to hear from a few folks um, that are in the healing uh, organization, just how does that show up? Um, what, 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 um, how would you describe the healing lens or healing perspective of your organization? Because I think it's helpful for all of us to hear, like, it's, it's such a wonderful place to be. So if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing. Anyone that may have mentioned they're part of a healing organization. Yes. Hello, this is Anita. Hi. I'm gonna see if I can turn my camera on, sorry. Okay, and just until the end, in case it does not come on. So I'm, I'm a part of a, or my employer is a Christian organization. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a few ministries that they hold um, for the women and both the men and the families to participate in. Um, and they go over a lot of spiritual things, um, not so much of the religion, portion of it, but um, mostly spiritual, um, inspirational um, stories and experiences. Some of it is based on, um, you know, the Holy Bible, which is what the Christian religion follows. Um, but then there's other events that take place where it encourages families to participate and to share their stories. And um, some of the things that come up or events that come up that families um, like to participate or hold like birthday parties and uh, re family reunions are encouraged and welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and that's, it's lovely to hear that, that, uh, that experience, that perspective. Anyone else um, in terms of being part of a healing organization? There was just one other person that mentioned that. Okay. And or anyone that marked trauma informed, what uh, are what are your thoughts in terms of how to um, you know kind of move move the needle up, move the needle towards healing uh, organization? What, what would you think would sort of help or need to be in place? And you can put this in chat or you can unmute yourself. Okay. 
Yeah, thank you, Lynette. Yeah, that, you know, the leadership has to be part of the process. Um, and, um, you know, we might think of that as like um, an approach towards shifting the policies, procedures, yeah. All of that to reflect more healing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I had a question. Yeah. On um, what well, I, I was just kind of curious on how trauma informed care, like what that kind of like looks like when dealing with substance use disorder, um, mm -hmm. and if it's like kind of supposed to be like the same across the board. Because I feel like. Um, like with substance use disorder and like that sort of behavioral health realm, I feel like that's like a, um, I don't know, it's like a different, it's like a different thing all together. And um, like, do we approach having like, you know, trauma informed care like in the same way? Um, Cause I feel like, especially in Alameda County, like when we only have like three months to work with them um, and we are trying to disrupt like really um, toxic and sometimes lethal behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if like any studies have been made on that or like if you had any information on how folks approach, you know, trauma-informed care um, in substance use treatment. Yeah, really good question. Um, I'm assuming that's Lynette. Um, yeah. And I know two of you are together. Okay. Um, yeah, really good question. And I open that up to the group. Uh, any thoughts around that? Um, I can certainly answer from, from my own perspective, but when I give an opportunity. How is trauma informed approaches, um, you know, applicable to um, substance use and addiction? Maybe while other folks are thinking. Um, so one thought is um, the harm reduction model. Um, that is a trauma informed model. So, you know, coming from the framework of uh, how to help people, um, you know, in many ways, it, it's not abstinence per se, but it's how to move in that direction. Um, so minimizing the impact of harm over time um, and, um, you know, supporting people not only where they're at, but where they want to be. So from a goal oriented framework and a lot of those, you know, motivational uh, conversations are part of that as well. Um, and so I would say that is kind of the model of trauma informed um, for working with uh, substance use and addictions. And um, I appreciate you bringing this question because there is something called trauma informed interviewing, which I'm going to talk about in a few moments, um, which is applicable to all types of conditions and populations. So that's sort of a a, a way to think about how we do trauma-informed care and trauma trauma sensitive approaches. Thank you. That's really, really helpful actually. Yeah, good. Thanks. Okay, so I really want to get us into this section because this is one of my favorite um, parts of talking about how trauma, how we work with with trauma and how we work towards um, the concept of resilience, healing, and post-traumatic growth. So what we know is healing is totally possible. So I love this quote, which is to say that, you know, just like physical injuries, healing from emotional injuries, wounds, trauma is a natural human process. And it happens slowly and it happens over time and it happens with the right factors in place. And so all of you that are here, I would imagine are part of the nature of that healing element that people so need right now. So healing is totally possible. And um, resilience is that perspective. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, when we heard the example from, from Lola, but resilience in itself is the ability of 
people or communities to cope with adversity and trauma and adapt, right? And it's supported by a lot of different factors like supportive relationships, feeling a sense of connection, um, having the skills in place, um, and then even from cultural and uh, traditional approaches, really bringing around that air of hope, recovery, stability. I love this. Um, I found this uh, mural. This is from downtown Oakland. This is about, mm, I think, April-ish, um, where you know someone, uh, a graffiti artist, um, wrote, "The coronavirus is a wake-up call. It's our chance to build a loving society." And I do believe that. Um, and to me, that's an example of uh, resilience: um, is taking kind of where we're at now and reframing that to um, how we can do better, how we can support each other. Um, and kind of think about what we're engaged with in a different way. And I'm sure all of you have many, many examples of how um, resilience shows up in your community. So let me just ask, what are some ways that you've seen resilience come up? Or how resilience gets shown, demonstrated? Lola shared an example of her own experience. Yeah, thank you, Claudia. Yeah, asking for help and it's okay to do that, right? Because there is, there is support available and there is community available. So an aspect of resilience is maybe even opening up to vulnerability and asking for help when needed. Thanks for that. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, how we can promote healing within relationships. And it's a model that, um, you know, I like to call the, the three C's. So the first C is calm, the second C is comfort, and the third C is collaborate. And with all that I'm talking about, I want you to keep in, the, in mind and the perspective of, when you care for yourself, you're also caring for other people. So part of this model is also your own self-care. So engaging in calming, engaging in comforting, and engaging in whatever collaboration might mean for you. So we're gonna go through each of these one by one. And in the calm, the first C, um, I want to bring to mind some ways that we can work with the, the mind and the body for, uh, to help uh, people um, who might be in the midst of a trauma experience. So if you remember our trauma continuum, we talked about shock, trauma, and stress. And you can see when people are in these different phases, there's different ways that we might work with them, right? So in that shock state, remember people are mostly in that, in the past, they're, they're stuck in the past. So we wanna use approaches that actually re-embody, right? Bring a person back into the present. And I'm gonna go into these in just a second. From an, a trauma place, their adrenaline is pumping, they're in that fight, flight, freeze space, right? So we wanna do things that are more about uh, grounding and um, calming body techniques. And then in the stress phase, um, we're focused on, remember the person in, um, in stress is in the present, but they're having trouble really like, you know, um, calming really, right? So here we're gonna use all the skills around listening and, you know, breathing techniques and maybe even problem solving and coping. Cause this is the only place where people can really get to that place of, um, okay, I, I can do something different or, you know, I'm able to do something different. When people are in shock and trauma state, they're less likely to be able to problem solve. So just keep that in mind um, in terms of where people are at. So in terms of shock, right, when a person's in a state of shock, we definitely want to avoid too much mental activity. You know, we're trying to bring attention into the present time and place slowing down the way that we speak, using comforting words and voice. And for any of you that might work with children, for example, even things like singing and humming, 
So bringing in that sort of, you know, idea of comfort because the person is disengaged, they're disembodied, they're um, dissociated, right? So we're trying to get them back into the present. Here's a really, really amazing, lovely exercise that you can do in the moment. So let's say someone is in a state of shock or a state of anxiety, or you know, this even works for people who are in panic, panic mode, panic attacks. It's called the 4321 exercise because you ask a person to describe four things that they see, three things that they hear, two things that they smell and one thing that they feel. And notice that we're using the senses because that's a way to engage with the self, engage with the body. So seeing, hearing, smelling, and then finally what they feel. And so you can really, you can go in any order here, but the last one is always what they feel because we're trying to help people name an emotion, name a feeling, because when they get to that place, they're actually grounded. When a person says, you know, I'm feeling really angry. I'm really disappointed. I, I am so frustrated, right? When a person gets into that space and names it, it's actually a grounding um, place to be. So 4321, really helpful for shock, anxiety, panic in the moment. It works beautifully for kids as well, who might be, you know, um, kind of, you know, dissociated or all over the place. And then we can do different things with the body, right? So this is one technique. Um, these are, it's a form of acupressure, if you will. Um, and this comes from a Japanese um, um, and Asian cultures where it's a way of gently holding parts of the body. In this case, you're holding the fingers to support the person in a place of grounding and healing. So you can see from this picture here that every finger has um, an emotion tied to it. It also has you know, an organ system that gets tied to it. So let's say for example, that you used this 4321 exercise and the last thing a person said is, I'm really sad. You know, I, I'm, I'm really, really, really sad, depressed. You could ask them to hold their ring finger which is the one that's connected to sadness and just gently hold that for a while as they're talking to you or as you're supporting them. So just a really, you know, there are many, many techniques, but I'm just bringing you a couple here of how we can help ground and support people, especially when they're in a state of shock. Moving into trauma, right? Trauma, remember people are in that past present duality so we want to do things that bring the person, again, also into the present, but are more on that grounding, stabilizing perspective. So this is a really, um, really great technique uh, called the butterfly hug. This, I, this, there's some pictures here that you can see, is used globally um, in different countries, um, refugee populations, war-torn areas, uh, di all different cultures, ethnicities, um, inner city uh, youth. Um, and very simply what this means, it's sort of like giving yourself a hug, but um, you, what people will do is, um, you can see on the left hand side of your, your slide here, and I'm going to demonstrate it as well if you can see me. And I, I um, encourage you or invite you to try this out for yourself. This is our experiential part of our, our workshop here. So you cross your hands over linking at the thumbs um, and your palms will be facing yourself and you'll bring that to your chest, your chest area. Um, sort of both hands will probably lie on your collarbones. You can also, um, you know, spread that and um, have both of your hands on each of your upper uh, parts of your arms, um, like you see in this picture here with this, uh, this child, this young child. So it's like a, giving yourself a hug, right? And essentially what you do is you tap from one side to the other. So whether you go right to left or left to right, you're going to tap one side each side with each other. And you can do this for 10 to 15 counts and then stop and then take a breath and then restart it again. 
And the reason that we do this is this is called a bilateral movement, which essentially means that when people are in trauma, their right side of the brain and their left side of the brain are disconnected. So when we use bilateral motion, we're actually bringing the left and the right together and allowing them to integrate. So tapping, especially butterfly hug tapping is really helpful, especially in the trauma mode. And play with the, um, you know, how fast or slow. So whether you're doing this for yourself or coaching others to do that, they can also play with that. You can also work with this in different ways, right? You can, um, you know, ask a person to imagine a safe place um, or bring to mind colors, images, sounds, smells, all of those things, again, using the senses to ground the person. So that's the butterfly hug. Then we move to the stress. So stress is, um, you know, uh, again, the person's in the present. So we want to engage with the person through nonverbals, body language, reflective listening, um, also um, problem solving and coping if it's appropriate. Um, in the stress space, the first way to engage with someone is from a state of calm. Now I bring this up because calm is something that for yourself is super critical and super important. And then when we're calm and then we're working with another person, it actually brings calm to that other person. So this is called co-regulation. So being in your own state of calm offers calm for the other. And then we can co-regulate the emotional state. So self-care for yourself as, far, as well as self-care for others. So I wanna take us really, really quickly through a breathing exercise, a calming technique um, that I love. And I'm gonna do this for just a few moments, um, just so you can see <clears throat> and experience how this one might work. So um, what I would like you to do is go ahead and Get into a comfortable position, feeling your feet on the ground, feeling your body in your chairs or wherever you happen to be, and starting to take a few deep breaths. So we're gonna to start to inhale through our nose and then exhale through our mouth. And as you inhale, just noticing the air as it passes through your nasal passages. And then exhaling and noticing as the air leaves your body. And taking some deeper breaths so that you feel the air going down into the different parts of your body. Maybe even feeling your belly expand as you breathe in and your belly contract as you breathe out. And if you keep breathing, go ahead and keep breathing for a few cycles. And what we're gonna do is we're going to bring to mind the colors of a rainbow. So we're gonna start with the color on the outer edge, which is the color red. So as you breathe in, go ahead and picture the color red, wherever it is in your body, allowing it to expand like a bubble as you breathe in and then contract back to a small little bubble. So inhaling the red will expand and exhaling the red will contract. And on your next inhale, imagine that red color and an emotion or a feeling that goes with red and then contracting and letting it go. And again, inhaling red, opening, expanding, contracting and letting it go. Now we're moving to the color orange. So inhaling orange, wherever that is in your body, allowing it to expand and then exhaling and letting that go and contract. Inhaling orange, exhaling and letting that go 
Inhaling orange with an emotion and exhaling and letting that leave your body. Next color is yellow. So inhaling the color yellow, letting that expand and then exhaling and contracting. Inhaling yellow with a emotion or a feeling and then exhaling that emotion and feeling and contraction. Now we're color green. So inhaling color green, wherever that is in your body. Exhaling, contracting. Inhaling again with an emotion. And exhaling and contracting. The color blue, light blue, wherever that is in your body. Inhaling light blue. Exhaling, contracting. Inhaling light blue with an emotion and then exhaling. Indigo or dark blue is our next color. Wherever that is, just inhaling the dark blue color, letting it open up to the far reaches of your body and then exhaling. Inhaling dark blue with an emotion or feeling and then exhaling. And then violet or purple. So wherever that is in your body, inhaling that violet purple, allowing it to expand. And then exhaling and allowing it to contract. And on the next inhale, inhaling it, allowing it to expand just outside of the reaches of your body and then contracting it. And one more time, inhaling and exhaling. And now doing a body scan of all of the colors that we just went through, knowing that you can go back to any one of these colors and give it a little bit of extra attention. And now envisioning a bubble around you. So this is a rainbow bubble of all the colors. This rainbow bubble envelopes you and it's your bubble of protection. that will allow you to engage through the rest of your day and into whatever you need to do next. And then you might start to wiggle your toes and your feet. And if you feel like if you've uh, closed your eyes, you might open your eyes at this point and just come back into the present moment. Just notice how you feel, how you might feel differently than when you were, where you were five minutes ago, where you were at the beginning of this training. What's different now? So this is called rainbow breathing. And um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, you're feeling really relaxed. That's the point. Yes. So really, really great technique that can be used uh, effectively for people who are in stress mode. Um, and, you know, for that calming sense that, you know, virtually everyone needs. Pe most people can identify with the colors of the rainbow. And then what I love about this, too, is that typically the red where we start tends to be the more active, fiery, angry emotion. And by the time a person gets to the blue and the purple, it's more of a cooling color. Really great technique to use with kids too. Rainbow is something that's identifiable for kids. All right. So other modalities that are available to you, um, I just put them up here on this slide. I won't read through them, but there are a lot of different things that people can do for trauma support. Um, that is part of that um, space of calm. All right, I'm looking at the time and um, I want to go really quickly through the other C's. So the other C is comfort. So we've worked from calm to comfort and we're talking about how we work in partnership with other people, promote healing. So in terms of um, rapid post-traumatic recovery, <clears throat> this comes from uh, the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Uh, Council, who talks about the fact that 
Post-traumatic recovery is absolutely possible and can happen pretty quickly, especially when we engage with people in a way that maximizes collaboration, empowerment, shared decision-making, um, respects the time that we engage with a person, um, and offers um, this supportive and consistent kind of framework of a relationship and growth. And for people, having an established sanctuary or a safe space, having the resources, ongoing case management and possible, and then really giving people the permission to share what they're feeling, right? To take away that feeling of shame and guilt that is so common, offering empathy, words of validation. And this is the biggest thing, right? Which is that let people know that you see them and that you hear them. Fundamentally, that is the most important thing that we can do, especially for people that are, um, you know, experience a lot of trauma in their lives, is that I see you, I hear you, I am here for you. For the most part, people haven't heard that. And that could potentially be the most healing statement that we make. And then to collaborate, right? So collaborate right, might mean working towards a common goal. Um, again, everyone has a role to play. You don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic. So um, there is something called trauma-informed interviewing. And just to you know, kind of make the say that the, the framework around this is that to say that, you know, unfortunately, we have a system that is oppressive and trauma-inducing. And so ways to support people so that they don't re-engage in their trauma are to understand that people have limitations in terms of their memory and brain development, no signs and symptoms of trauma, which we've been talking about this whole time, integrate knowledge about trauma into the conversation um, and not re-traumatize. Right. So I love the way that Lynette said this earlier, which is that people might not have the words, but we as caring professionals can share with them what our perspective is of what they're experiencing. And then provide space that's empowering and healing um, and supportive. So trauma informed interviewing. Um, and this again, this is something that comes from regardless of who you're working with or the condition that one has starts from a person-centered model, a person-centered approach, the harm reduction approach. And this might sound familiar for, for many of you that might have uh, had um, motivational interviewing in your past. We actually use the ORS model. So the ORS model is O, open-ended questions, A, affirmations, R, reflective listening, and S, summary reflections. This is conversationally from a, um, a, a coping and collaborative kind of perspective. This is a fundamental way to engage with someone that comes from a place of kindness, compassion, empathy, and support and can move person in, move a person in the direction of um, healing, growth, and pulls out that resilience pulls out the natural resilience that most people have. So to use your, your, these skills is really impactful. And then a couple other things about, um, you know, how we support people with um, safety, empathic approaches and collaboration. You know, so being aware of, you know, your nonverbals, um, not asking too many questions and coming from a sort of what might be conceived as a con uh, interrogative, interrogative approach, pacing, timing, offering breaks, et cetera. Are there other things that you would add in terms of collaboration, safety, empathy? And I'm gonna wrap us up in just a second, but just wanna make sure if there's anything else that could be helpful for everyone to hear. All right. Um, and then just a note on the importance of validation, right? So we talked about how um, for most people, 
feeling guilt, feeling blaming, feeling shaming of the self and being harsh on the self is really common for people that have experienced trauma. Um, and to just, you know, remind people that they're not to blame and everything, anything that happened was not their fault. Um, and then connect them to resources, because I think that's a really important role that all of you play too, is the ability to connect as needed. So that was our um, healing um, kind of uh, run through, if you will. Um, the, three, uh, the three C model is calm, comfort, and collaborate. Okay, so yes, if you all, if you need to uh, leave, I'm just gonna recap. These are what we've talked about um, so far. Um, actually, I should say so far. During our time together, these are all the things that we've covered and talked about. So just as a summary, you have that here. Um, and um, to thank um, the um, AC3 uh, platform, the Skills Development Unit, thank Yadiel, who is in the background doing all the technical support, and to thank all of you for your time. I will stay on for a few moments if there's any thoughts, questions, um, last minute feedback. Um, and thank you for being here and being part of this, um, this workshop this morning. <laughs>